Hi, welcome to uh, Elm Street Congregational Church, a United Church of Christ uh, congregation located in Southridge, Massachusetts. My name is Catherine Light. I'm the pastor here, and I want to welcome you to our 20-minute Bible study. We are going to look at the book of Joshua uh, tonight and for probably the next four or five weeks. And we're going to read some stories about that. And what I want to do tonight is just introduce you to the book of Joshua. So uh, Joshua is the book that comes after Torah. Uh, the Pentateuch, when Christianity we call it the Pentateuch and Judaism is called the Torah. And that's the first five books. You remember there, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and Joshua. And what Joshua book does is it picks up the story after Moses dies. So in Deuteronomy we have Moses, he sends spies into the land of Canaan but he dies before he can uh, enter so he never gets to enter the promised land and Joshua then picks up the leadership of the children of Israel who have been wandering in the desert for, for many many years. And um, Joshua is considered to be the uh, book that has both history in it and um, stories that have a point. So the, the point of Joshua is that the children of Israel enter the, the promised land and that they uh, conquer it militarily. Now, scholars debate on whether that is really what happened, because if it is really what happened, then we're talking about a genocide of a people. But the people, the, the author or authors of Joshua weren't writing a history like we would get in a history book. They are writing history in a way that it tells a specific story. And they want to show how God is with people who follow God's law. And we'll see that in the first uh, chapter. So we probably will not be reading the entire book of Joshua, but we'll read parts here and there. So we're, the first chapter sets everything up. And then next week we're going to learn about um, Rahab and the um, city of Jericho, which is a story that um, Vanessa I can probably get you a Bible uh, or you can go online to um, Bible Gateway and there you have all kinds of translations um, at your fingertips so if you have internet which I apparently do because you're uh, listening to this to the Bible study you just need to go on Bible Gateway and type in Joshua and you'll get the whole book. Just shows right up on your screen. And in any translation that you like. I like NRSV. Um, but there are a lot of translations. So in this first in this first chapter, we're going to uh, situate the time of Joshua. So this book is thought to have been written somewhere in the middle of the first millennial BCE with parts being added as late as the 6th century BCE. So here we have what happens after Moses died. So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant saying, My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the Israelites. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon I have given to you, as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and the from the wilderness and the Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea in the west shall be your territory. No one shall be able to stand against you. 
all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall put this people in possession of the land that I swore to their ancestors to give them. So the swearing to the ancestors, when Abraham in Genesis uh, leaves his homeland and follows uh, God, he was promised all this land. And we're finally now getting to the fulfilling of this promise um, in the book of Joshua. It says, um, only be strong and very courageous, being careful to act in accordance with all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. So, uh, remember, Moses got the, the law, not just the Ten Commandments, but all the law. And we can read about it in uh, Leviticus and Exodus and Leviticus. And uh, then again, it, it's talked about in Deuteronomy. And this law becomes very important because this is now, the law is the touchstone. And obeying the law will bring success to the Israelites. And disobeying the law will bring death. So Moses commanded you, do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, so that you may be successful wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to act in accordance with all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall be successful. I hereby command you, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you everywhere you go. So what they're saying in the text is that you need to internalize the law. You need to meditate on it day and night. And actually there is the Shema in Deuteronomy that talks about um, meditating on the law of the Lord both day and night, when you get up and when you lay down, when you go away from home and when you come home, uh, back to home, put it on your, your doorways. Um, which actually in Judaism they do that with what's called a mezuzah and it actually has the law uh, in it, the Shema, so that you can remember how important it is to have God's law written on your heart. And, um, and, and it keeps saying be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous. So this is not an activity for the faint of heart. Following Yahweh you need to be strong and courageous. Now you can be strong and courageous according to the text because God is with you. Emmanuel, God is with you. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, pass through the camp and command the people, prepare your provisions for in three days you are to cross over the Jordan, to go in to take possession of the land that the Lord God gives you to possess. Now what they didn't say, right? is that that land is already occupied. There are people in that land, we generally call them Canaanites, they're, Sem they're Semites, they're Semites. So they're related to the children of Israel. In fact, some of them may be their relatives from um, several hundred years ago. And so this, this makes uh, the story of the settling of Cana Canaan really a sticky wicket because there's going to be a lot of bloodshed, a lot of war, and it's going to be couched in very religious terms. But what God is going to do, it, or what people think that God is telling them to do, is go and kill all those other people off, and then you can take their stuff. Now, we can talk about whether that is a morally and ethically good thing to do. We can talk about whether or not that actually is what happened. But what this probably is, is it is a, a theological understanding of what was supposed to happen, not necessarily a historic view of what did happen. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So to the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, 
The Lord your God is providing you a place of rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your livestock shall remain in the land that Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But all the warriors among you shall cross over armed before your kindred and shall help them until the Lord gives rest to your kindred as well as you and they too take possession of the land that the Lord your God has given them. So what has happened is that these two and a half tribes already have their land that's on this side of the Jordan. But even though they already have their spots, uh, Joshua is saying, but God wants you to go and help the rest of us get their land. So uh, your kids will stay here, your wives will stay here, your livestock, all your stuff is going to stay, but you're going to go and help us militarily take over the rest of the land. And he says, and then when when you when they have, when they have their land, then you shall return to your own land and take possession of it, the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you beyond the Jordan to the east. So Moses was allowed to uh, settle two and a half tribes into land, but he could not cross the Jordan and make it into the actual promised land that he was spared from doing. So some people think that Moses didn't go in because God punished him because he touched a rock instead of just talking to the rock, or he disobeyed God in some way. But the rabbis often look at Moses not being able to go into the land of Canaan as he was spared from all of the war and the bloodshed and the horror that would be perpetrated on the inhabitants of Canaan. So that's something too that we, when we are looking at biblical stories, we need to look from certain point of views. It's real easy just to read from the point of view that the text wants us to. But as we will see in the story of Rahab, there are more than one side to a story. That God gives a land that already has people in it to the Israelites, and then he has the Israelites chase the other people out. Why couldn't God have just given them land that wasn't inhabited? Or why couldn't God have chased them out on his own? What was it about the act of killing your enemy that appealed to either God or the people writing the stories? Those are some really, really serious questions. And these are questions that we get to ask. And we can talk about them. And if you have a question and you want to type that into the comments section, I would be more than happy to discuss them with you. Um, and I am glad that, that you are showing up. And even if you put one on later, I can go back and look at it and then, and then answer it also. That's for all of those of you who aren't watching it when we broadcast, but watch it later. So here is what the two and a half tribes said to Joshua. They, they answered Joshua, all that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your orders and disobeys your words, whatever you command shall be put to death. Only, this, only be strong and courageous. So here we get this omniscient to be strong and courageous. And when we look at what they do, at least what the stories report that they do, they need to be strong and courageous because they're apt to do some pretty nasty things. Um, so um, that is the first chapter. And I have both a, a Christian study Bible and I have a, a Jewish study Bible to look at and compare how they look at this. So oftentimes, people of religion like to glorify the past where they are the victors or the winners. But we also need to look at that, that people who are the victors and winners are also the perpetrators of violence against other people. And, and this is hard for us in religion to look at because we want to think that we are doing right and that God has given us all kinds of uh, dispensations to do whatever horrible things it is we think God wants us to do. 
Now, I'm not saying that God didn't want them to have the land of Canaan, and I'm not saying that there wasn't issues that had to be worked out, but I think that the larger lesson here is a lesson for today. So when we when we meet Rahab and her people, we're going to do a little uh, exploring into the emotion that a person would have when they betrayed all their friends, all their neighbors that they had known their whole lives, and what that would do to your psyche. We also want to be mindful of military use when we think that the military use is that and that's what God wants us to do. Everybody says just wars. We'll have a just war because we are right and might is right and whatever we want is right. And we're finding out over time that might not necessarily be right and that there probably isn't such a thing as a righteous war. And if a God so loves the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, and who commands you to love him and to love each other, how does that God then also command people to war, to kill others? Those are some serious questions. Now, I don't have any answers. and You might have answers, but I think it's worth uh, discussing. Because so many times when you turn on the news, you hear somebody saying, God wants this and God wants that and whatever God wants. And, and they often can pull up a scripture that will show that that is indeed what God wants. But uh, the other way is also true. If we pull up a scripture and says, well, God wants this, then we also have to pull up the scripture that says God loves the world. And that everybody counts, right? The parables that Jesus gives us is everybody counts. So how do we reconcile this? And maybe it can't be reconciled. Maybe we have to look at this as being not necessarily a historic document as in, as in things where somebody was sitting there with a clay tablet and a stylist writing down what was happening. Okay, like a newspaper reporter. Probably not. What we get is stories that have been told for hundreds of years that eventually get written down and they get written down with a particular perspective. So I... Um, we can think about our own country history that we get all this wonderful stuff about our country when we're little kids. We get George Washington was an honest guy. He was so honest when he cut down the cherry tree. He couldn't tell a lie. You know the story. Uh, which, by the way, is not a true story. That was a story that was made up by a minister. He was trying to show a point. And the point was that our founding fathers were you know, honest and reputable people. Well, we would like to think that's true, and that might be true in some cases, but it might also not be true. Because we know that people, humans, you and I and all the other humans, have um, multifaceted personalities that we choose truth, we choose what to believe, we have perspectives, they don't always match up, and we have a hard time seeing something from someone else's point of view. So that's one of the really wonderful things about the book of Joshua is we're going to get to look at a, the point of view of the text, but then we're also going to get to explore points of view that the text don't share with us, but give us an opportunity to explore. So I see that we are running up against our 20-minute, um, because it's a 20-minute Bible study. I'm very glad that you popped in tonight, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and let us have a word of prayer before we go. Holy God, our Father and our Mother, we thank you so much for being with us, for giving us this holy book so that we can explore it, so that we can come to understand you, so that we might understand ourselves, and we, we might be able to be better disciples of Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, what we're going to do next week at 7 o'clock is we're going to look at chapter 2, when Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men to secretly spy. And they go to Jericho, and there they spy and work out a deal with Rahab. And we'll see what kind of a person Rahab was. So, it's exciting. I'm glad you're here. This is a journey. I love doing Bible studies. God bless, and I will see you next Tuesday. Bye-bye.